to get started. We may have a few more stragglers come in, but we might as well start. Um, all of you, I think, know me, but I'm Gretchen Wilkins, the head of the architecture department. Um, and this is our first guest lecture since I've been here, which is Sandy Atiyah. So we're really, really excited to have you here. Um, Sandy, I know through the University of Michigan years ago, where she used to be a fellow. Um, Sandy was born in Cairo, Egypt, raised in Kuwait, and spent her university years in the States to then become principal and co-founder of Modus Architects in Northern Italy in 2000. The foundation of the practice lies in a belief in making buildings last to be loved, favoring a disciplined alliance between crafted tectonics, inventive engineering, and hybrid programmatic solutions. The practice's consolidated and award-winning body of built work is complemented by a number of written publications and research-based projects, which together affirm Sandy Atiyah's commitment to exploring the broad, multifaceted range of architectural inquiry. Sandy has held faculty positions at academic institutions in both the US at Michigan, um, at Princeton, where she is a visiting lecturer this semester and has been previously, um, as well as in Italy at the University of Trento. She continues to seek out avenues in which academic and professional pursuits converge and feed architectural debate. Guided by an unfaltering belief in the capacity of architecture to bring people together, coalesce ideas, and posit synthetic responses to complex issues of contemporary culture in our built environment, Sandy Atiyah relies on her knowledge of the discipline of architecture to define and fuel transdisciplinary practices. Please welcome Sandy Atiyah. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for coming. Um, so I'll just um, start a little bit. Um, as you'll see, our work is quite different in um, maybe the scope and some of the topics that we look at, um, but the, jog the location, the geographical location of our work is, is not. It's all pretty much in the same place, and that's in this region called South Tyrol in northern Italy. And I think it's important to, to say because um, the context is really specific, so it's um, not city condition. It's not um, uh, a kind of pristine uh, landscape, but it's a really, how would you just say, it's like a really manicured, uh, heavily settled um, environment, set landscape of valleys and mountains. So you'll be seeing lots of valleys and mountains <laughs> tonight in, um, in the lecture. And um, <coughs> what's also particular about South Tyrol is that it's on the border um, with Austria and there's a really um, heavy influence of um, German and Austrian culture. Actually where I live 80% is German speaking and that also kind of affects the way in which um, public projects, for example, are administered and this is, <coughs> they have, we started out our practice through competitions and, um, and that's actually quite different from the rest of Italy. So it has a really lively culture of contemporary architecture. So um, we're part, let's say, uh, I have a practice with my husband, Matteo Scagnol, and we're part of um, uh, a culture of a lot of uh, building. So we are architects that build and we express ourselves through built work. So, um, <coughs> and I thought I'd just start by um, jumping into two projects without really talking more about our approach and so on and so forth, and just as a kind of warm up, and also because these, uh, the first two projects I'll talk about are projects that we are just finishing up, and I actually just got some of the photos this morning from the photographer for one of our projects, so I thought that would be a good place to start. And if we have time, and since uh, you're a select crowd, <laughs> maybe you'll be privileged <laughs> to, um, we, it depends on you know, how, how, much, how long you wanna stay, but we could also uh, look at the project that we worked on for the Italian Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, which then we transformed into the studio topic at Princeton that we're doing now. Um, so the first project is, as I said, it's um, one that I just got the images of, and it's a house project. And it's actually um, quite different <coughs> uh, from some of the projects that we, we generally do. 
and it's in a place, um, this is <coughs> the Valley of Bresinone, so this is, where I, this is where I live, and it's in one of these conditions, it's like kind of halfway up the mountainside, and um, so it's a kind of, it's a village type of setting, and uh, so here you see the project, and what happened was that the owner, he inherited a piece of property from his family, and he lives very close by to also his siblings, and there's a, a hotel. So this is the project, this is the hotel that his cousin owns, and then his parents live here, his sister here, and his brother there, and so on and so forth. So it's all very uh, familiar, let's say. Um, <clears throat> and so on the, on the right you see the property, and on the left there's a kind of site plan. And um, the first thing that, when we met with them, the first thing that they said was that they wanted a house that they could breathe in. And I thought, well, okay, that's kind of a default um, condition in a house. I think everyone breathes in their house. And um, what he meant by that was that uh, I guess they, have a ha they had a house that was, you know, hallway, corridor, and rooms, and also the kitchen and the living room had their own doors. So each function, each space had its own uh, dedicated uh, room, and so it was really uh, cut up and fragmented, and there was never this sense of release in the house. So that idea of breathing was basically the brief they needed a house to feel free in. So with that, um, with what you see in this first sketch, like we were interested in creating this horizontal condition and working with a kind of open plan. And um, so in model, <coughs> you see it kind of sits on the ground and juts out from the ground and creates this, uh, these, with these two, the two planes are the floor plate of the ground floor and the roof plane. So um, architecturally speaking, that was uh, what we were looking at and how, how to define the space by these two planes. And these two planes then were rotating off of the central core, which is the service core and, um, and the stair. So as the first image, this is, uh, um, it has, it has, like I said, part of it is grounded and part of it is slightly cantilevered out, so kind of reaching out for the view. And if you, <coughs> this is that ground floor plan where you enter into the house and all of this is an open space. So it's from living to kitchen to dining to another kind of living. And then they have their room uh, up on this floor and then you go down the stairs and there are um, the rest of the rooms uh, for their kids. And so <coughs> we were interested in the wife. She has a like, really minimal aesthetic, and she wanted to have kind of seamless, uh, bare minimum spaces. And so, and the husband, on the other hand, he also he sells um, he sells furniture, very nice furniture, and he also has a furniture making shop, and he has um, a, a mill mill. He he has a carpentry. <laughs> Never speak English anymore. He has a carpentry, <laughs> he has a carpentry business. So <laughs> we're trying to reconcile these two aesthetics of like seamlessness and then something that's more crafted with wood and so on and so forth. So um, we were looking to use the roof as um, the element that had a kind of thickness to it and more of a tectonic. And so uh, we worked with um, uh, cedar wood and to try and uh, create this kind of pattern and this, um, this richness to it that was in contrast to this really dark, um, seamless floor. And so I'm just gonna show you a series of these spaces. This is when you enter in um, and you're in the first living area and then you're in the kitchen looking out and looking back to the dining room and then this is a kind of second um, living room space that they have. And um, Part of working with these clients, we were interested in, in trying to um, get at the texture uh, of these walls that they live in and also how the house presents itself because the house went from something being completely white to, oh, let's, you know, we kind of introduced, well, why don't we work with this core that's a concrete core and with this cantilevered roof, it's actually a really complex roof structurally to get it to float. Uh, outwards uh, to make that s open space. And we started uh, working with um, these clay, uh, clay finishes um, to try and give that uh, warmth uh, to the house that uh, is in contrast with this uh, exposed concrete walls and um, the, the continuous floor. So here in section you see that central core and then you see the, um, the, living, uh, the living space on the ground floor and then the bedrooms down below and you see how then the stair falls into that and you create <coughs> this kind of space around this core. 
<coughs> and so this core, like I said, it's exposed concrete. So um, we worked with uh, planks of wood that were actually quite thin, and that created a kind of density and a, um, a, a yeah, a kind of density to that wall. And um, on that then were registered uh, the kind of functions that were adjacent to that wall. So this is an unfolded, what would this, this was an unfolded elevation of that, of that core. Um, so an image of the bedroom and the bathroom, and then this is the kind of changing area of the room. So this is one project um, that we've just finished and staying not uh, staying close within the vicinity. And the idea about this project, you know, with a house project, people joke about it a little bit that uh, architects become psychologists when they work with uh, private clients and doing their house and, you know, choosing out bathroom fixtures. I've always sworn every time we do a house, we're never going to do a house again. But there's something about when people invest in building a house. Um, and a private single-family house is actually not that common where we are, so it's a it's a big investment. That there's a there's a kind of search for understanding what kind of architecture, what kind of spaces correspond to who you are and how you live. So it's not just about kind of luxurious space or the view in and of itself. It's it's often about very um, direct conversations uh, with the client who's interested in figuring out. Um, <coughs> how they're built, how, the, how their selves are reflected in something that's built. And this kind of co uh, relationship between identity and built form uh, comes into play in the next project that we are um, in the midst of finishing, and it's the Tourist Information Office for um, Bressanone, which is where we live again. And um, what's interesting about this project is that it is a... Um, it's a project, it was a competition, and it's a project that is right next to the Bishop's Palace, so there's a few buildings that are considered of historical re uh, relevance in uh, Bressanoni, and this is one of them, the Bishop's Palace, because uh, Bressanoni used to be the seat of the bishop. And um, <coughs> there's, uh, we started looking at some of the views of Bressanone um, and how it was depicted and what kind of identity was ascribed to Bressanone through, through the times. And we kind of stopped at this image because um, there's this element of some a foreigner visiting uh, Bressanone and uh, has this kind of, um, uh, it's actually a, a very kind of Austrian depiction, the, the kind of painting quality of this view has this Austrian depiction that's looking at Bressanone in and of itself as uh, a foreign uh, uh, terrain and then also putting in uh, someone who seems kind of uh, exotic, uh, looking out onto this view. So there's this there's this theme of exotic, uh, of the exotic in Bressanone in relationship to the Bishop's Palace, because actually, the, um, there's this garden that's adjacent to the Bishop's Palace that has these pavilions that mark the corners, and they're little follies. Uh, and there's a one um, there's one Chinese one. It's called the Chinese Pavilion and the Japanese Pavilion. So um, actually the pavilion on the right is what I look out onto. I live across the street from this <laughs> pavilion. So, <laughs> um, And <coughs> these pavilions are um, what became a topic, actually, of this tourist information office, looking into past projects that the site on which this tourist information office is sitting is the site of many pavilions that have been there and then demolished. And they all kind of take on this idea of the folly and they have a kind of lightness to them, these light structures, you know, during the fascist period that they're kind of taken, you know, lifted slightly up, up off the ground, working with these curves and these really slender columns. And, um, and then we move into the 1970s and a local architect built uh, this pavilion and it was kind of low, but it was actually had this wall that um, defined one edge of it and created this divide between these two streets. And actually, these streets are, are pretty important. Maybe I have a, are pretty important for Bressanone because that's basically how you get into um, the city center. And so it's at this point of these two uh, roads coming together and it was sitting, the, this, the, um, <coughs> the tourist information office was sitting close up to this point and it was to be demolished. And, we, and our site then was from here to here, 
and it was open as to where in this little wedge of land where you could uh, position the pavilion. And why we won the competition is basically because we said, okay, we're gonna butt up uh, against an existing building here and we're gonna free up this little space. It's actually very little, but it's completely changed the way in which um, uh, people gather and it's become a kind of meeting point. Also for tourists, like, oh, okay, let's meet at the tourist information office because there's just simply space now to do that. And <coughs> so you see that here. This is the Bishop's Palace. This is the garden. And the, this is, you can kind of see them here, um, the two pavilions. And um, this is where I live. And then this is, <laughs> This is the tourist information office, and actually, to be even more ridiculous, this is where, um, let me see, this is our office here. So it's a, it's a crazy triangulation, and I don't have to <coughs> commute more than one, one minute by foot. So anyway, <coughs> so with this uh, project, then, we're kind of interested in uh, working with a pavilion that kind of touched the ground on its tiptoes and lifted itself off uh, in a, this kind of interpretation of what these pavilions um, were beforehand. And we are also interested, if you look here, in, in, in considering part of the site as these two trees and uh, using this as the kind of marker at that point and having our building engage uh, that the existing tree. And so here you see that tree up front. Here you see it without all the leaves because it, it's winter. And then this is the space uh, that, that's been created um, by pu simply pushing the tourist pavilion back. And there's this kind of overhang and that's where the two entries are up above their offices. So you enter the offices here, otherwise you en enter into the tourist information area. And you have these uh, interesting views with the Bishop's Palace um, behind it. And <coughs> so here you see another view and we kind of framed um, this one wing of the Bishop's Palace. And uh, like I said, it kind of <coughs> embraces uh, the tree that was existing on the site. And there's this relation, it's the first time that we've actually built a building, um, which is incredible. I can't believe we waited this long, but it's the first time that we've built a building in exposed concrete. Um, and it was actually very, it's a small building, okay, but for us it was actually really complex to try and uh, understand how it's insulated, for example, and also how, <coughs> we'll see some images of this in a minute, how the concrete was um, poured all at once for both floors. So then how the intermediate floor was anchored into the um, poured walls. So <coughs> in plan really quickly, these are the two entryways. It's kind of a public space. And then this is when you have your questions, you get your maps and so on and so forth. That happens here. Otherwise, you go upstairs, and then there's a simply a series of offices. So it's a very uh, simple floor plan. And of course, there are some kind of weird decisions that go on where, for example, in this meeting room, there's no window. And we were also, one thing about, our co about the competition that how we had kind of sold this as a, a place of events, so whatever kind of activities and events and fairs and concerts and so on and so forth that was going on in Barcelona, that they could um, use these walls of the building to publicize it. And it's actually what happens. Um, so with these first, uh, it's <coughs> right now it doesn't look like this because another thing about the project is that um, we said, okay, actually we'll create this kind of little mini urban place and we think that this area could become pedestrian and um, it could actually become all uh, paved differently, like cobblestone, uh, rather than being these uh, asphalted streets. And that's actually what's happened. So as soon as they opened it, they then, all around it, it's a construction site, and they've decided to make it all pedestrian. So it's actually transformed now the way one of uh, the, <laughs> the, where cars go, people aren't so happy about this decision <laughs> yet. But uh, for the pedestrian um, experience, it's actually very much appreciated. So that's also something about the project that, um, you know, how these little um, moves can actually transform in a significant way in existing context. So I just wanted to show you some of these drawings of the engineer um, that talks about <coughs> the kind of complexity of the structure because of course, the engineer was not particularly excited when he saw how few points there are that touch the ground. And that we said, oh, it would be really great since it's just a small building, it's just a little small pavilion, that we could have no joints that showed the, the, the different timings of the concrete pores. 
So he said, okay, so we have to pour all of this uh, at once, and we'll pour it as an empty shell, and then we'll um, put in the floor plate, which, which would be fine if it didn't also have uh, curved surfaces. So the geometry of the formwork, plus it had these arches that were lifting it up off the ground. So actually the formwork had to be uh, specially cut. Sometimes it was cut in, in, on site, and it was actually really uh, fascinating to watch how, um, how this was built. And not to mention that the windows also had a kind of strange form to them. Uh, so here you see um, when it's all poured, and then these are some of the anchors that are used to, uh, so this is the formwork uh, onto which they're gonna pour the, the floor plate, and these are the anchors that kind of separate um, the wall from the floor, because of course where we are, um, everything's insulated like about that much. <laughs> So that's not something I think Saren and, uh, did <laughs> worked with very much here. So um, this, this idea of insulation and, um, and uh, sustainable solutions for uh, the performance of the building is actually um, part and parcel of the way in which uh, you design um, because it's also, of course, a, a mountainous climate. So I'll just show you some images of that. Um, I just thought this was pretty strange. Uh, uh, finishing the tree with rebar and kind of buttressing it. These, these look, if we get to um, the, the Biennale project, it's about a post-earthquake town and all we do is now look at buttressing. <laughs> and so I, felt, I thought it was very strange to, to look at these uh, buttressing for formwork and that's actually the buttressing that you see in these post-earthquake towns, but I'm not even sure we're gonna manage to see that anyway. so. I wanted to show you some of these images on the inside to also uh, expose concrete as a, as a ceiling. And um, here are some of the images before um, it was completely finished. So, um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the power of two. Um, what the, you know, architecture has a, a kind of beautiful gift of synthesis. And um, by synthesis, I mean, you know, the straightforward definition of the combination of, of, of different elements or just of elements in general to form a connected whole. And with just this really simple idea, we found that um, what's amazing about buildings is that they can actually bring together very different ideas and disciplines as well as people to produce a singular work. So they, you know, a building has to respond to a lot of different things and it is only that one building. So it's synthetic. There's something very synthetic about architecture. And <coughs> in particular, I'd like to talk about in the, in the projects that I'm gonna be showing now about <coughs> this idea of when two things come together that maybe they have nothing to do with each other or they seem like, it seems as though they have nothing to do with each other and it's this fusion or more often than not, this kind of tension between two differing things. So, you know, like what? I don't know, it could be an idea. It could be a direction, up or down, or um, it could be also two different disciplines, how they come together in, uh, in a work, in a building. And that um, actually it, it produces a whole world of um, inquiry in, in our architecture. So with that being said, the first thing, the first one of the, this is an old project that we did, um, the one on the top left. It's, um, it's basically a heating plant. I mean, it's called a cogeneration heating plant. But what happened was that we were called in by the muni municipal services of Bressanone, a hometown, like I said. <laughs> so, and they said, they had asked us to come up with a number of ideas to come up, they had received the drawings for the heating plant. And the funny thing about these heating plants um, uh, is, is that they, they, you know, they kind of rear their ugly head in inconvenient places within the city because there's a logic to them about the infrastructure and heating and, and heated water that uh, has its own logic that doesn't have an urban, um, uh, an urban design, let's say, logic to it. So <coughs> in this case, there was an existing skate park on this um, property and it's right next to, um, so we're down here, and it's right next to another religious kind of convent that is of historical re relevance to the town. And they're very worried about the impact of uh, building a kind of very engineering, infrastructure type of 
structure. And so they asked us to do some cosmetic work on this project and said, you know, can you fix it up a bit and make it a little more pretty? And so we said, okay, well, what about if we actually take on a, a kind of more industrial vocabulary and um, we use that uh, to become the safety net for the, skate, for the skaters so we don't have to move the skaters anywhere else. And um, you can combine these two elements into one where maybe you thought they were incompatible. And so um, that's what we did. And so here, and then um, uh, after that, what happens is so you have like the central heating plant and then there's a number of subsidiary heating plants. And, and in this case, during the night, the, heat, the, the excess hot water is then stored in these cisterns and they're actually really high. So half of this is underground. And so then you have the central heating plant and then you have another of subsidiary heating plants and they too also follow a logic that, that follows this underground uh, infrastructure uh, that's needed to carry hot water to the whole town. And so we worked also on that project as a kind of um, urban furniture piece um, that had two worlds, the above ground and the below ground. So just to say that <coughs> this, pro this first project that we started working on, it kind of opened our eyes to, um, well, how much architecture can actually um, state ground in engineering pro projects and the relationship between architecture and infrastructure and how uh, actually um, also what happens b below ground is very relevant to what happens above ground in, in architecture. And this is gonna come out in, in a number of projects. So um, this is just to show you, so we created, so it's just a box, it's not a complex building because of course um, the budget, we couldn't make <laughs> a really fancy skate park and had just asked us to do some plastic surgery on the engineers uh, building for the central heating plant. And what we did is that we worked with this cage to, to, to create the safety net. And then the skaters came in and they, um, I mean, we didn't design the skate park. They came in with all their equipment. And it's actually a become a place. All the kids hang out there. And what's also uh, really fun is um, <coughs> we connected the, the lighting system with the kind of consumption that goes on. So as the light changes, it was a way to <coughs> bridge the divide because it was a highly contested project. Nobody wanted this um, in infrastructural, um, horrible, ugly building in their beautiful town. So we said, okay, well, let's talk about um, lighting and how that, that can communicate the kind of consumption that's going on. So as, <coughs> as consumption goes, it, you know, when more hot water is being used, the, the light changes in certain ways and it's a way in which it communicates, let's say, um, with the people. And on plus the actual ramp um, that leads up to the, this rooftop, it's, um, it's the vent, it's where the vents, uh, where the hot water, uh, not the hot water, the steam, the excess steam, hot steam comes out. Um, for, we, ha we had it so it comes out from beneath this ramp. And in the winter time, it's where all the cool kids hang out is on, on this ramp. So it's really become, so how a piece of infrastructure has become uh, a social space um, for the younger generation. And um, <coughs> like I said, so with the subsidiary heating plant, it was right next to a school, and they're very concerned about uh, this relationship between uh, this heating plant and the school and, uh, you know, the kind of de decor of it. And so we worked with this um, metal um, facade uh, that was simply wrapping these uh, cisterns that were then buried half, here you see that in section, that they were buried half within the ground, and that there was this kind of underground, it's a, it's a place of work. I mean, people come here and they work, so you, we also said, okay, it's an environment where people spend their entire day, so what kind of conditions can we provide for them, and what kind of light can you give them so you have a kind of graded rooftop? And, um, you know, to give a, a kind of poetry uh, to Mr. Robinson. Welcome, you're late. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, and this is a view, uh, so this is a view um, back behind it, and as we get closer on the other side, it has a view out towards uh, the Izarco Valley, which is again, Bressanone, so the next project is a kind of conflation of all these ideas of infrastructure, its relationship to the underground, and how that affects um, the valley condition because 
resting on it, you know, the thing about um, living uh, in northern, in, in this area of northern Italy, land is actually very precious because you don't have that much land that you can build on, so everything's very uh, concentrated within the valleys. And this project was for a ring road. We were also called, and now that I think about it, we were called in to be kind of cosmetic um, fixer-uppers to this engineering project that uh, that the community was up in arms about and said, you know, something had to be done. It, had, it was a project that the engineers had been working on already for 10 years. So it's a ring road, a series of galleries um, and tunnels. Uh, so tunnels and um, uh, portals to these tunnels uh, that is a linear uh, uh, piece of infrastructure that is also part of a number of other elements like the A22 highway, and the A22 highway is the highway that connects uh, Italy to the rest of uh, to the rest of Europe, Northern Europe, and so it's really ha heavily um, a lot of traffic. And then there's also the the main uh, north-south railway line. So then there's our ring road, and then there's also the Isarca River, and all of that has to happen in the valley. And so it's actually for it being a very pristine and beautiful mountain town, it actually has a lot of infrastructure in it. And it, on top of it, because of its uh, condition as a valley, um, <clears throat> you look down into it, and it actually really matters what it looks like from above. And moreover, there's a lot of um, issues with sound, because <clears throat> if you're here, you don't really hear, for example, the highway. But if you're where Fisher is, the Fisher house, he can hear, <laughs> he can hear the traffic on the highway. So the valley creates this kind of um, echo chamber. And so also the idea of sound uh, was an important aspect of this project. So um, there were many different elements and we kind of tried to take an inventory of all the things that there are. So like the, the way in which you enter into the tunnel, the chimneys of the ventilation system of these tunnels, the, um, the electrical substations, the, um, uh, what are, what the, the um, sound barrier, not sound barrier. <laughs> Yeah, sound barrier, and um, and then also the, the the kind of retaining walls that um, that are needed to kind of dig into the ground before you reach the portal. So we did a number of these, um, and, there, and there are two sites. So it's connecting Bressanone to the next town, and we kind of uh, uh, took, like I said, an inventory of them, and we said, okay. There's, um, you know, 60% of these are underground and 40% are above ground. And we said, let's just divide them into two different categories because there's a lot of different engineers that were working on the project. And so when we had the project presented to us, it was just like this hodgepodge of technical solutions, actually very advanced technical solutions. Italy is one of these countries that has an incredible technology in, in um, boring uh, tunnels. So uh, as an engineering feat, they're, they're amazing. But all that that goes with it, um, it's, it's really a kind of a mixed bag. So we said, okay, let's just kind of separate these into two different conditions. One has to do uh, more with the curvilinear, um, and those are the under things that have to do more with the underground, and then the above ground conditions are more linear. And with that, we just um, started working on these very specific points. So we didn't intervene, of course, on the whole. I mean, this, like I said, the project had been going on for 10 years. So we just had a very small window of where we could inject some design. So uh, we worked at uh, the intersection of, of streets, uh, how you go into the ground, what's that kind of experience as a motorist, and what happens when you come out of the ground, and um, what happens, uh, what accompanies you along the way, working with, you know, uh, prefabricated uh, elements that uh, the, um, the engineers work w with roads. So if we're usually talking about centimeters and the kind of precision that goes on, um, engineers with this project talk about kilometers. So for us, it was, it was a, a very um, strange uh, scale change also um, in precision because it's not at all a precise kind of way of, of working anyway. so. These are a number of the portals, and then what was really fun was to work on this ventilation chimney because <coughs> um, this was actually not part of the project, but we proposed to them, we said, look, there's two of these ventilation chimneys, they're actually huge, and they're gonna be these really big stainless steel, you know, technical um, chimneys that were coming out of the ground, and you can see them from all over um, the valley, and you can actually, um, they're actually, 
uh, one of them is in a, along a hike, a walk, and we said, you know, they're not, they're not just technical um, uh, objects, they're actually something that people are, are going are, are gonna to walk along, and they become part of the landscape of Bressanoni. So we suggested, I don't know why, but we just came up with, <laughs> came like that, and they said, well, you know, does that work, two chimneys instead of one? <laughs> I don't know. And, and then they tested it out, and it actually works better than one, and so it was a happy uh, coincidence. But um, <laughs> so that was, um, that was, you know, it takes a lot of convincing because, you know, the budget also, of course, it comes down to budget. You have to talk, you can't talk about sculpture and kind of objects within a landscape. You have to, you know, um, talk about it as a kind of functional solution and how people are going to be up against it and stainless steel and maybe it's a bit hot and not that Corten is not, but anyway, so... Um, we had all kinds of strange discussions about these things. So here we see also um, the sound barrier, and we just worked with really uh, basic elements, and this a wooden, their their wooden slats with um, in, uh, um, acoustic um, insulation behind it, and it, working with wood was actually a strange kind of proposal, but it kind of domesticated uh, a little bit this piece of infrastructure that, you know, right on the other side there are houses, there are people living there, so this was also very important in the kind of public hearings that we had uh, with the community to talk about also the materials of these elements. So, um, and so, as I said, working with these um, infrastructural projects, they're small infrastructure, I know it's, you know, we worked in a small condition, but we were invited by Maxi, you know, the Zaha Hadid uh, Museum in Rome. We were asked to do a project specifically for the exhibition that talked about what would happen. Do a project for post-petrol, what was it called? Post-petrol um, um, networks and architecture. That was the commission. And there was uh, seven of us, one of which was Sue Fujimoto. <laughs> like, okay, so um, we said we had a year. For about six months, we, we didn't have a project. And then finally, we were like, well, what about, you know, if you think about the infrastructure of Italy, you know, the, the kind of highway system of Italy, it's, it's an incredible piece of infrastructure. If we could talk about actually the road in and of itself and how that could be something that could produce... Um, energy and that it could also produce architecture because if you look at kind of the history of the road particularly in Italy there was this kind of euphoric moment of um, post-war uh, uh, construction that was actually very beautifully engineered and then it kind of went downhill from there and it never stopped going downhill so it's like this gray space it's very technical nobody wants to live by the highway or the freeway and it's just this nebulous gray zone that it's you know, relegated to the corner of ugliness and you just go there because you have to. So and we said, well, what if you could actually talk about um, the highway in a, in a completely different way? And, um, and, uh, and if you think about energy and petrol, because it was our topic, we're saying, you know, well, what's funny about it is that oil, it comes from the ground and in and of itself, you don't see it. It's all the kind of um, in the, all the kind of drilling and boring and uh, extracting that you see, but then when that's done, they go away, and it's still hidden within the ground. So again, this kind of relationship between underground and above ground and what you see and what you don't see. And instead, electricity, that was when also people were talking about the electric car, and they were starting to put um, ways in which the highway could generate electricity um, through the surface of um, the, the road itself or putting like wind tunnels and you could generate uh, energy. You know, there was this whole discussion that was starting in Italy about this. And, and we were saying, well, actually with, um, with electrical energy, unlike oil, which is underground and it has mass and volume, electrical energy to produce it, you need a lot of surface area. And um, <clears throat> so we started thinking about, well, what if you covered, it's not... Uh, you know, what if you covered all of the um, highway infrastructure of Italy with a roof and this became a plane and a place that you could occupy and it's a place that could actually generate energy. So this is just like a first sketch that we did um, and we worked with some engineers to make some calculations and there was all kinds of statistics involved with this that I'm not showing here. But anyway, is, and we made these huge models. They're seven meters long and they <laughs> occupied this incredible space in, in the maxi. And um, <coughs> to kind of uh, talk again about, um, you know, just the relationship between energy and architecture. So it, 
you know, starting with just that small central heating plant, it kind of opened up new avenues of inquiry for architecture. And now architects in our area are always called when, when there's a new road that's being put in or a bridge or this, that, and the other, which beforehand architects were really marginalized in this. So it's become much more um, of a discussion between um, the public administration and what role architects can have in the design of um, the infrastructure. So, um, um, I'm going to skip this project. This was a, it's an underpass at Brenner, Brenner Highway. Um, so this was again talking about the highway, but I want to go to <coughs> the Costner project, which is a house project. And this is a little bit um, more explicit about this idea of two, where two come into play in a very specific way. So one is, it's a project that, um, it's for an artist, and he was looking to build his house and have his artist residence in the same place. I actually did a project like this in undergraduate at University of Virginia, and I thought, oh, it's one of those projects you're never gonna actually do, and, I, and we did. It was, <laughs> it was amazing. And, um, and the other thing, we <coughs> worked with two volumes that were connected at a base, and the kind of relationship between these two volumes created this um, interesting spatial condition that allowed for um, the that re that allowed for this um, uh, juxtaposition of atelier, like st artistic studio and uh, living spaces. So the other thing about working in our area, you always have at your back or or in front of you these mountains, and they have an incredible scale to them, and that is your context. And so you always are confronting yourself with these enormous structures that. Um, that, that you have to, that we've begun to, um, I mean, as you grapple with it, they're just these, uh, they're this ever present um, geological condition that um, affects the way in which you work. And so kind of trying to um, create an architecture that is um, bold enough that it can sit next to a mountain. I didn't explain that very well, but. Um, so the other thing is that in Casarotto, um, unlike other towns, Casarotto, they they're very, um, they're, uh, they don't like modern architecture. That's the synthesis. And because it's a threat to their tradition, their traditional um, urban morphology, urban, their traditional uh, morph morphology, and it, they're worried that um, by introducing very contemporary um, buildings within their landscape, that's actually going to turn tourists off because it's not an authentic South Tyro Tyrolean alpine mountain um, place to come visit and go skiing and hiking and so forth. And so Hubert Costner, the client, he was very, um, he's a contemporary artist. He works in installation and media wood sculpture, he works kind of uh, in many different media, and he wanted to use his uh, building as a protest, and he wanted to uh, use it as a kind of critique of that kind of uh, position against all things contemporary, and so it was a mission, and um, he was part of, um, he was, you know, he was, an, I would almost say he was a third uh, author of the project, he's a very important figure, um, needless to say, the project, we had a lot of difficulty in getting this project passed. And so we, 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 we took on a different strategy. We said, look, you know, it's not the building doesn't fit with the context. It's actually the context that just doesn't fit with the building. Because if you go back in time, look, our, we did this terrible photo montage. Our building looks great in the context. And you guys have ruined this context with this faux traditional uh, <laughs> peripheral uh, building. And so, um, anyway, we took this whole stance. It was just ridiculous. And we ended up going to the president of the region at like four in the morning on this like private viewing of the project. He made some phone calls and we got the project passed. But um, anyway, that, that's, so, and the project is on the ridge of the town. Um, so again, you, another thing, we're always having to work on the slope. So that's in and of itself also a topic that we've had to, um, make our own. And the other thing is um, what's really important of working, I think, maybe in, um, uh, well, in Europe in general, but particularly in Italy, there's 
this, you, you kind of always take a, you look at what's around you in the kind of tradition of building and the kind of stratification of history. And in many ways, we just try to read what we see and offer a different, um, uh, an interpretation of that. And this is also actually very important when you're um, pitching projects in the public administration or you're talking to people about uh, contemporary architecture. It's really important that there's a kind of reading of the existing condition and understanding of the historical, um, le like the palimpsest of history, so that you're, so that it's not seen as like this architectural gesture that is related to just the architect um, themselves, but it's actually a reflection of contemporary culture in um, the context in which you're working in. So one of these uh, buildings that we pass by uh, very often um, uh, near our house is a farmhouse that's actually, uh, we call it the Siamese twin, because it's they tend to have these farmhouses that have two parts and they're connected at the hip or at the base in a certain way. And so we were interested in that and also the relationship of these um, farm buildings being all roof uh, in wood and then with like a stone or stucco base. So we were looking at those also spatially because th these big roofs create these incredible spaces underneath. And they have this kind of relationship between the ground and the sky that we are again, so like above and below ground that we we're interested in looking in and having this um, very, bold um, kind of figure up against the mountainside. So we were working a lot on the kind of how these two forms come together. And um, here you see it in plan on along that ridge. And you see it how we were trying to maintain the height of it and uh, this idea of the base. This is the artist's family house. That's where he grew up in. And he inherited it again, the piece of property right next door. So you see that, you see that base, that ridge line. It's a concrete base. And then you see it here, um, this wooden structure on um, this kind of V, uh, these stilts. All of it, all of the wood is, all of these uh, elements are structural. And um, so from one side, it's kind of towering. And then from the other side, it's kind of got a smaller domestic scale to it. And in section, you come, that you enter on this level or Hubert, when he goes, some of his artwork is big. He has like this double height space. And then this is his living uh, area up above. So that's that ramp that goes down. He can park his car, unload his things. This is like a gallery space in his wood shop. And then at that core, um, there's this concrete stair off of which these spaces kind of pinwheel off of. And so this is um, the main entry door at the ground level. He has an office space, and then that's that double height space uh, above his studio. And then you go up the stairs, and it's just pretty basic. I mean, it's kitchen and living in their bedroom. And then, and then you divide up into two worlds. And this is actually quite interesting, because you go up into these two different bedrooms up above, and they're not connected to each other. So you have to go downstairs. Um, to go into the other one, and he, he actually really likes that about the project. So sometimes he has people come and stay as a guest, and they're very separate, or sometimes <coughs> he has two kids. They've now separated them. They used to share the same bedroom, and they've separated out, and they have their own two worlds. So this is an image of that double height space, the gallery space. It's all um, northern light, um, just, and that's that uh, concrete core of the stair. And then he has like a mock-up gallery space, so he wanted white walls, at least in one space. And uh, you see kind of the construction documentation of that, um, uh, all of it, like I said, concrete, and then as you go up, because, you know, of course, wood doesn't like to touch the ground. So that's, you know, what do you do with a wood building? How do you, what's that connection to the ground? Um, and uh, so here's an image that's a mirror, kind of gives that continuity of this, curvilinear stair and you start to go up and then at a certain point the concrete stops and then the world of the wood starts and then when you get up it's it's entirely wood and so all of the wood is raw grade wood um, exposed it's not covered and so you have to kind of do strange things to fit in the you know the electrical uh, cabling and so forth and then all of the you know like the handles and the fixtures and all of it it's designed um, and all of it's a hodgepodge of wood. So you go up um, and it's just, and also the smell of it, you can, you can smell all of these woods kind of melding together. That's their kitchen. And what's really particular about this project 
is that this project has become a, pro a starting point for many other projects. So like a documentary was made of this um, uh, of by a, a film producer in Berlin. It's become a location for um, a contemporary art scene. It's become like a hub. It's, it's, gr it's gotten its own life. Um, and I think that's exactly what Hubert wanted. And it's now on the front cover of all the tourist information material for the town. And so this kind of statement of saying, you know, look, contemporary, you know, us as artists, as con people working in, on contemporary issues, it's important that it's a reflection of who we are and what we do, and it's actually a way forward and not to have this kind of faux mass, uh, faux authentic experience that's catering to these mass tourists. That's actually not what they want. And so, for example, you know, when he, s when he first started, mo when he first moved into the house, you know, he started looking at how the sun cast shadows or like, you know, uh, the solstice cast shadows on the handles and all the handles were, you know, we designed and it, it's just, and he also etched into the, into the, onto the facade. Uh, he wanted to etch in, you know, he also does woodwork and so he wanted to etch something and he had, he came back all, all kinds of crazy things. First he wanted to etch his nose, like the profile of his nose on the bill. He has a really prominent nose. It has a weird shape to it. I'm like, why would you want to do that? That's crazy. And then he wanted to write the times of when his wife was breastfeeding in a certain period. And then what he did, I don't think I have an image of it. And, and what he ended up doing, he etched in the plan <laughs> of the building. So the building has on its facade, he's like uh, burnt the plan of the building because he was so bound up to this project of what this, you, you know, he poured over the plans of this project for two years, didn't produce anything. So um, it was like this release when he finally moved in. So just a couple images uh, of of their that's of their bedroom, and then these are the these this is the larger space, the living spaces up above. It's the other um, bedroom, and then this is going into the office at the ground floor, and you can actually walk all the way around the building, so that creates this kind of complexity with um, this structure, and then again down into his studio space. Um, and so, like I said, it's all cross-laminated timber or light from construction for the, for the, mm, oh, there it is, I do have it. Oh, he's crazy, the guy's crazy. And so, and then there's all kinds of, you know, they have an incredible um, capacity, well, not only for millwork, but also for carpentry, um, for construction site carpentry um, in South Tyrol. So it's actually an incredible laboratory for us. Um, actually, Gretchen, in the book that I gave you, that three of a kind, it's three projects, um, and maybe, you know, you could share that with some of the students, is that there are three projects that we're working on at the same time, all in wood. So it was also this learning curve for us to work in, um, in wood, and, you know, there you just have masters of, of what, you know, these are kind of things for us. We, you know, we are wondering, well, how are we going to have these, this structure touch the ground, you know? Oh, we'll just fabricate this foot. And then this foot um, uh, will just, um, it will notch into there. And so we'll just cut out, you know, it's actually much easier. Uh, we didn't have to draw any of this, which is also um, a bonus uh, when you have people who, who know how to work with wood. So again, that kind of relationship between the ground and what comes up off of it. So, um, how long have I been talking? An hour. So, <laughs> we could. What should we do? Should we? We can. We can. You know, I don't know if we should. Um, well, you know what? We can. Let's, let me just, yeah, I'm not sure. I can either, I can do that or I could show the last project is um, a mountain lodge. Those are your two choices. We can take a vote. <laughs> what would you prefer? Do you want to look at the, because it might be more interesting to, um, to some of the students to look at the Venice, but I don't know if in 10 minutes is long for us. Let's, you can do it. Okay, we'll see. We'll see what we can do in 10 minutes. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so we were called by um, the curator of the Italian pavilion 
he called six offices and he said, I'd like for you to do a project, and it's a project on the internal areas of uh, Italy, and um, uh, we're going to be looking at all the, the forgotten areas of Italy, so full of problems and issues, and nobody talks about them. They're kind of, you know, the uh, archipelago. The, he redrew Italy as a series of archipelagos that are isolated unto themselves. So a lot of these places are um, places that... Um, are uh, suffering from depopulation, so they're losing their population. Um, they have a lack of services, and they are, um, but they have incredible resources. So it's all those three, like those are the three common denominators. And we were assigned this town called Camerino, and um, it's kind of two hours uh, east of Rome in an area of Le Marche. I'd never been there, never heard of it. This is terrible because there's this big earthquake in 2016. And um, I had heard of these other towns like Am Amatrice and Accumuli and Norcia where, um, you know, people died. It was really tragic and it was in the news and so on and so forth. And said Camerino is also in that area. And no one died, so of course it never made the newspaper, that never made the headlines. But it's a town... Um, that's abandoned and it's fully intact. So they, as a kind of homework here, here's your town, go to it. And so, um, so this project is looking at how architecture, just very simply, what can architecture do in a very complex uh, situation as the post-earthquake uh, reconstruction town? So, um, so this is the area that's it, that it's in. And I, we started looking at, I kept coming back to this one image because the more you kind of heard about um, all the difficulties of these reconstruction towns, because there's a long history of them. And so maybe some towns that were hit four years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, they're still abandoned. They're still in a state of just complete, um, they're just uh, place, forgotten places. So, um, and architecture actually, it seems like architecture can do very little. But uh, I was looking at this, um, <coughs> this, this painting of Siena after the earthquake from the 1400s. And what was interesting about it is this relationship between inside the city center, the historical city center, and outside. So it's immediately recognizable what happens after an earthquake. Then you have these temporary structures that are put outside the town. They're tents. And then, the, uh, and so you can immediately recognize it. It doesn't matter from centuries past. And that image remains. But the big difference is that um, the earthquake through history was an opportunity of uh, urban transformation. And what happens is that outside of the city center, these uh, temporary structures are actually um, remain for many, many years until they disintegrate and people have to go elsewhere and nothing happens within the historical city centers. So that's like a really um, broad statement. But generally speaking, that's the kind of, um, uh, that's the kind of line of it. So Camerino, this is um, a flyover of Camerino. You can see it's pretty much intact. I mean, if you look closely, there's kind of damaged areas, but it's this, you know, picturesque hilltop town and after the earthquake, um, uh, people left and never could go back uh, because it was declared uh, unsafe. So, so what's interesting is that what's going on outside of Camerino, like I said, there's uh, a lot of construction uh, going on. And this ground that um, trembled, it was kind of, we kind of started to talk about the ground as like the traitor of Camerino. Um, uh, is exactly the ground, this kind of hill, it almost looks like Tuscany. We have an Ital Italian in the, in the audience, she would not agree with me, but my, my first uh, idea when I went there, I was like, oh my gosh, it's like Tuscany, you know, with these rolling hills, I'd never been there. And actually, th this view of the rolling hills is so dear and precious to the people in Camerino because it's the view out from their town into the landscape, and it's conflated with their identity. So it's not only you're in a, a, in a hilltop town, very dense condition, but that is always in relationship to this, uh, this view around you. And so when, after the earthquake, what happens is that this ground becomes, of course, um, uh, dug away, flattened out, uh, kind of domesticated, made neutral, and then you put you know, the tented structures or you put the emergency housing, and it becomes a completely different, of course, context. So um, the other, so that's one, uh, and so the first thing is that 
it became clear to us that the relationship between inside and outside the historical city center is uh, a key topic. This idea of the ground as being part uh, of your identity was another. And the other one has to do with time. Because earth earthquakes, um, uh, it's, time is frozen. And not only that, it turns time on its head. So something that you did yesterday, um, it's no longer accessible. So it's like from your distant past. And um, the kind of future that you imagined, it's completely changed. And actually, your town becomes like a kind of archaeological site. So um, this sense of time is completely upended. And in this kind of fissure of time, it's really important to think about reconstruction, what happens now, and then how people can come back in, in it's a 30 to 50 year timeline. So um, this topic of time was actually also uh, very important. The other thing about Camerino, with many hilltop towns, but you know, of course, Camerino, they think they're very different, and it became um, the subject of the project, is that um, Camerino it has an incredible uh, patrimony of cultural artifacts, and this is one of them. And they have 4,000 pieces, so it's all been, uh, it's kind of inventory, so in all of the churches and the museums and so on and so forth. So a town of 9,000, and they have, you know, uh, they have this incredible, uh, cultural, uh, artistic patrimony, as well as um, a whole repository of very precious antique books. And um, just as how you have to save people, you know, how people have to be evacuated, also the artwork um, had to be evac saved. So you see how this artwork was taken out of all of, uh, of their homes, and they were taken underground. And I discovered that Camerino actually is, has a second city, a shadow city underneath it, and it's actually uh, fully intact, and it's the safest place in Camerino, which makes sense, you know, during the war, they would go down, uh, and that was the, you know, the bunker area, and there are these incredibly beautiful cavernous spaces, and, and they are the beholders of all of these pieces of art and books, and, um, and they're there to stay, so these underground chambers are actually kind of like a prison, and um, so the idea was, what, what are we going to do with them? Because another thing, uh, part of this whole, uh, part of working in the Biennale, we were asked to do also participatory design uh, workshops with, these, with um, the citizens of Camerino to kind of imagine what they would like in their, their two futures now and in 50 years. And this topic of art and um, how the, the, um, the young generation is actually never going to know Camerino, that art and books are part, also part of their identity. And they said, you know, um, it would be really great if we could access these. You know, also, if you wanted to f uh, check out any book, all of the libraries in Camerino are closed. There was an earthquake in the 1990s that um, uh, damaged uh, earthquakes, that, uh, uh, that damaged libraries that had been moved after a series of earthquakes. So it's an incredibly strange condition where you have no access to culture, literally. You can't access one book, you can't see one piece of art, and uh, you can't see the town, only from afar. So we said, okay, and we called, uh, we called um, we, there's kind of the slogan, inside out, so taking what was inside of Camerino and taking it out, and being able in this 30 year window to give people the possibility to view art and kind of have contact with um, their patrimony on many different levels. So <coughs> uh, we called it a diptych. Um, so a diptych has two parts. Traditionally, it's like a hinged uh, a religious um, artwork. That, so it's two parts and they're connected together. Um, and this, this device of the diptych has actually been uh, used uh, very often thereafter, also through important contemporary artists. So we were interested in this idea of the diptych and looking at two interventions, one inside the city center and one outside the city center to talk about suturing time and place and people um, in this uh, long temporal spectrum of reconstruction. So um, <coughs> on the inside, we proposed a community, um, uh, like a civic, um, what would you call it? A gathering, it's just a gathering space, a loja, which opened on the ground and then a gathering space, and then this kind of cavernous hypostyle hall that could hold all of the art, and you would come down, and it's also an escape route for the next uh, earthquake. 
And I've already consumed my 10 minutes, right? <laughs> okay, you can add two. So anyway, um, well, so I think another, well, one final aspect to this is that we started looking at geological drawings. This, has, this is not the geological drawing. It's the Alexander von Humboldt drawing that I just collaged onto a historical view of Camerino. But this idea, again, of what happens underground, why did it shake in that certain way? It's com it's, uh, Camerino is built on bedrock of sandstone bedrock and trying to understand that kind of s geological stratification and also its position of um, being on top of a hill and its relationship to the outlying territories and how you could rethink um, temporary structures in a completely different way outside. So with that being said, look at this. I went there three weeks ago, it's amazing. So how architecture can also transform a simple cave into an incredibly noble space. You know, I'm going to just leave it. At, we're not going to get to the project. I'll leave it at this because it's another <laughs> 20 minutes. <laughs> Thank you.